Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily Timpey and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. During today's presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you experience technical problems, please use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be monitoring that area, especially during the start of our presentation today, so I can offer assistance if you need it. You may also use the questions pane at any time during today's presentation to ask questions you may have during the talk. Questions will be addressed at the end of each speaker, so we do have um, two different presenters today. We have Natalie Umflett from High Plains Regional Climate Center, and we also have Kyle Bray, um, who will be presenting the second half of the webinar from Southern Regional Climate Center. So we will have break the questions portion up so you can ask each presenter if you have any questions. So we will start with Natalie Umflett. We're pleased to have her today. Natalie Umflett is the Interim Director and Regional Climatologist of the High Plains Regional Climate Center. The HPRCC is housed at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and its mission is to increase the use and availability of climate data and information in the High Plains region. Natalie joined the center in 2008 and hasn't had a boring day of work ever since. She holds a Bachelor in Meteorology and Climatology and a Master's in Geosciences, both from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She is currently pursuing a PhD in Natural Resource Sciences with a specialization in Climate Assessment and Impacts and is expected to graduate next year. Although she has lived in Nebraska for quite some time, she is originally from Gainesville, Georgia, and became interested in the weather when a tornado hit her hometown, including her high school, on March 20, 1998. For fun, Natalie enjoys cooking, gardening, running, and traveling. So Natalie, if you're ready, go ahead. All right, thanks, Emily. That was a good introduction there, so I can just skip over this first slide and just hop right to it. So I know that last month there was a presentation by two of our sister sites, so um, there might be a little bit of review here, but that's never a bad thing. So the Regional Climate Center Program stems from the National Climate Program Act of 1978. Um, you know, it takes a few years to get things going, and so in the late 80s the centers were spun up, and so we've been serving our region for about 30 years now. Uh, each center uh, covers a different part of the country, but collectively we do cover, uh, you know, have national coverage, and our focus is on historical data. So you can see here the purple states in the middle of the screen, that's our coverage area, so Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Colorado, and Wyoming. We do a lot of work in the Missouri Basin, so sometimes we do branch out into Montana and Missouri. So each of our centers does have a different focus. You can probably imagine that you know, serving regional needs, we do have to serve um, you know, specific sectors. So probably not too surprising that out here in the plains, we have a large focus on agriculture and water resources. But you can see that across the country, there are different needs. Like you'll hear today from the southern region, and they'll probably talk about their um, coastal resiliency work. So we have a long history of serving the National Weather Service. And so some things you, you may or may not know is that the Regional Climate Center program does run several programs like Datzilla, uh, WeatherCoder, ThreatX, and probably what you're most familiar with, uh, tools like NowData and XMASIS. And many of these things are run off of what's called the Applied Climate Information System. And, and so that is the system that uh, manages the flow of climate data so that it makes it easier for end users to use that information. So if you can imagine, you know, we have all these different uh, weather stations across the country from Co-op to Kokoraz to Snowtel and Roz um, coming in to our network, to our database, and then um, we put that together to make it easier to make maps and graphs, kind of you name it, we have the infrastructure that you can use to build upon that. Uh, before the system was developed, Someone would have to go to each individual network themselves, grab that data, format it so that it would all be in one format, and then go from there. But with a tool like um, ASIS, you can make that easy. So our program does operate within this tiered system of climate services. And so that's climate services on the local, regional, and national level. So we sit in between. So we work very closely with our state climatologists and also the National Centers for Environmental Information. And so here at our center, we have seven staff members, and we specialize in three main areas. So monitoring, 
services and information. And so I'll take a, talk a little bit about each of these. So with monitoring, we do run um, what's called the Automated Weather Data Network. And it's a collective of mesonet stations from across the region, so about 300 in there right now. And so what we do is we grab that data from the states in the region, quality control that, disseminate it back out to them so that users can use that quality data. We provide services, so this could mean anything from answering a phone call, could be a middle school student wanting data for a science fair project, could be a lawyer needing data for a court case. A lot of you are probably familiar with that, that aspect. I know that the, the phones at the Weather Service ring quite a bit. Um, and so we do offer services to anyone who needs it. So we do phone calls, emails. They'll get the occasional fax and even snail mail coming in asking for data that way. And then also the IT side. So we do have three programmers at the center, and they specialize in keeping everything running behind the scenes so that um, you know, when people come to our website or get custom data feeds, that all of that runs smoothly. So the people coming to our site is pretty large and varied. Um, the majority are coming from universities. And so this would include research, teaching, extension, students. Um, and they're using the data for a variety of things. So we might have people who use the data for, um, you know, just a simple project for the end of the semester, or we may have people who use it for, um, you know, for specific teaching applications. Um, and then we also have a large, large amount of people using our data for research. And we recently did an, al an analysis of what types of papers were being published with the data from, from our center. And it turns out it's pretty interesting. We, look at a, we looked at about 550 articles that were published recently, and only 10% of those were actually from weather and climate related fields. So we had lots coming from agriculture, from engineering, um, from ecology, wildlife. Um, and so people are really taking this data and applying it to their own field to solve some problems. And so that was really encouraging because it showed us that we're not really just serving our own people. So it's not just me giving data to another climatologist or another meteorologist. It really is our center serving different fields across the country. Of course, not surprising, a large chunk of our uh, user group is from agriculture. And then also federal, state, local government, you can bind those, that's our next biggest sector there. And of course we do, we do serve the National Weather Service. So if anybody ever has any questions, you can call or write in and we're, we're happy to help with those things as well. So a lot of what we do it's not just giving people data. So for the most part, um, the days of just giving people chunks of data are over. People want analysis, they want synthesis, they want, um, they want to go beyond that. And so there are simple ways that we can do that through our website, like our ACES map products. And so this is probably one thing that most people are familiar with when they think of the High Plains Regional Climate Center. And so you can get these maps for all different time ranges, different variables, and also at different spatial scales. So you can see here we've got national, regional, and then a state level map of um, temperature and precipitation. So you can see very quickly, um, it has been very hot in the state of Montana. We also can take that down to the next level. And so there's some people who need the county level data for certain applications, especially if you're working with um, local government or even FEMA. They do require a lot of things to be in that county level um, aggregate. And so we do offer that on our website for the states that are in our region. For um, You can do temperature, precipitation with those. We also offer sta a station search tool, so you can drill down to your location. And what's nice about this is if you are a COCA ROS observer, this is a great way to access your very own data. And so with this station search tool, you can put in your zip code, you can put in, you know, you could put in Lincoln, Nebraska, you could put in Bismarck, North Dakota, and it'll pull up all the stations in the area. You can click on the one that you want, and then you can drill down and you can get uh, yearly accumulation of your precipitation. And so this happens to be a uh, Kokoraz station from one of our staff members on the south side of town. 
and um, so you can see all the individual days down through there. It's an interactive graph, so you can you can scroll over any of those data points, and it will tell you exactly what your daily precipitation was, and then the accumulated precipitation. And that's always nice for for folks just looking for data in their own backyard. We also have tools that are tailored for different sectors. Um, not going to go into all those today, but just uh, as an example, we do have a whole suite of agroclimate tools. And these were developed from the Useful to Usable project, which was a five-year project that was funded by the USDA. And it was um, based out of Purdue, but it had nine universities on the project and over 60 faculty and staff on it. So it was a very large project, lasted for five years, and among many outcomes, there were five climate tools that were built to help producers. And these were tested extensively, um, not only with crop advisors, but with farmers. And these now reside not only on our site at the High Plains Regional Climate Center, but also the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. And so if, for instance, anybody had some folks calling into your office and they need help with some some ag tools, this would be the kind of thing that you could point them to. Probably the most popular product is the corn GDD tool. And so this helps producers track um, growing degree accumulations for corn. Uh, this year, this is especially important. We've had a lot of replant, um, especially in the eastern side of the corn belt earlier this um, you know, late summer and spring, uh, sorry, late spring and summer. And so using that tool can help you um, determine if it'd be beneficial plant and then on the end of the season it can help you with your frost risk. So a lot of different tools there for different applications. Um, definitely worth a look if, if you're interested in agroclimate. So a little bit more about this automated weather data network. So we're going to kind of move into some things that we do with partners. And so this network, it really is a true partnership between the states in our region and our center. So each of the mesonets in the region are distinct. Okay, so for instance, the Nebraska mesonet, that's a standalone mesonet. Um, same with uh, Coagmet out in Colorado, standalone mesonet. But these mesonets send us the data. And so collectively, we call that the automated weather data network. And so we gather that data, quality control it, disseminate it back out, and that makes it easier to make assessments with some of the specialized data. And so this will give us things like relative humidity, soil temperature, um, evapotranspiration, so some of the variables that you can't get just from a, a co-op station or Cocoa station. Um, and so that helps with some of those agricultural um, related issues. We also support climate products from across the country. And so this is something that a lot of people don't necessarily know that we're doing because it's running behind the scenes at all times. Um, we don't necessarily have our logos on everything because the data is being incorporated into a, a particular product. And so I thought I'd just throw three examples out there to show what sort of things that our data are going into. So, Every day we send the SPI data, so Standardized Precipitation Index data, um, to the Eros Data Center up in Sioux Falls. And that gets incorporated into the Vegetation Drought Response Index, which combines observed data with satellite data to help monitor drought conditions. We also deliver um, a data feed to the USDA's Office of the Chief Economist out in Washington, D.C. And that data ends up in places like the um, like this average soil temperature map, um, and they use that data for assessments there. And then taking it down to a more local level, we also send data to places like Montana State University, where they are tracking growing degree days for the orange wheat blossom midge, which is a really destructive pest um, for wheat. And so just to give you a little tidbit, these are the kind of things that are running every day in the background, not necessarily um, out in the forefront on our website or anything, but just to show that, um, that we do support a bunch of different products across the country. So we also, uh, working with our partners, we do assess the climate. And so like I said earlier, a lot of the questions that we get from people these days, it's not just a simple, 
what was the weather like on July 4th, 1975? It really is this synthesis of data, this translation of data into information. And so some of the ways that we accomplish that is through monthly webinars, quarterly reports, and monthly and annual reports. And so the monthly reports, so each of the regional climate centers writes one of these for their own region. And these do get incorporated into the national reports that are put out by NCEI every month. And these are posted to our site by the fifth working day each month. And so this would be something where if, uh, you know, you've been out of town, you want to get caught up on what's going on lately, you could read one of these reports and get caught up really quickly. We also produce quarterly reports. And so these are broken down into different regions across the country. So you'll see here, this is for the Missouri River Basin. It's not necessarily for just our six states in the High Plains region. And so there's different regions across the country. Um, there's a Great Lakes region. There's Gulf of Maine region, for instance. And so these are done every quarter. It's just a two-page report, and so uh, it's fairly brief, but it does hit on all the highlights. And these are posted each quarter following the re release of the CPC outlook. So we're looking at, you know, the third week-ish of after each quarter. And then we also respond to emerging issues. And so an example here recently, we have this flash drought this formed up in the Northern Plains. And so we try to respond to these things by doing special releases of webinars or of two-pagers to help people stay abreast of the current conditions. And so we could do this for floods, droughts, INZO. Um, and this is just one example here. So you can see it just kind of goes over the highlights for the region, shows where drought has expanded. And then on the back side, it goes over the different impacts um, for this particular drought, it's been really heavy on the agricultural side, and so that's what we've detailed there. And so I thought I would highlight some of our current projects um, just real quickly here, because we do we are heavy on the data side of things, producing um, you know graphs and charts and maps and and feeding data to different people. But sometimes we have people who call in, they have questions, and it's not something that we can do very quickly. And so we will write proposals to try to find funding to work on bigger projects. And so one we have with, um, this is a NOAA SART project, working with several partners here in the region on municipal climate adaptation. And so what we're doing is working with city leaders to try to figure out ways that, can, that climate data can be incorporated into their planning process. And so we did a survey of um, all the cities in this four state region of at least 5,000 or more. And we found that over half of them are not using climate data um, in their processes, but they could be encouraged to if they had some more information. So things like a city specific climate report or a webinar that's for their particular city. And so they want to use the information. It's just not necessarily out there in a form that they can use, because a lot of that type of information is out there on a kind of a more regional or statewide manner. And so in order to address this, we're developing climate information reports, like the example you see here, the municipal climate adaptation report for Lincoln, Nebraska. And we're going to turn these into web-based tools. So we've been doing testing with the cities, trying to figure out if the, um, if the reports meet their needs, so what sort of climate analyses do they need and what could be incorporated into their planning processes. Um, so a very short one slide on, on two-year project there, but we're working through that and we'll have some things on our website soon to, to highlight those things. We're also doing some work on drought planning. And so FEMA has a process that, um, that a lot of people use to help assess their um, to help assess their capabilities uh, when it comes to different threats. So it could be something like a cyber attack or tornado, um, and that's called the Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. Well, it turns out that no one has applied this thyra process to drought, and so we thought that that would be a really good idea to try out here in Nebraska. And so we have been working with natural resource districts so local water resource managers to apply that process. And so we actually did a drought um, scenario back in April. 
and we're obtaining some good feedback from that to see how that went. We also engage tribes on a regular basis, and that's primarily through the NIDUS um, Missouri River Basin Drought Early Warning System. And you can see in our map here that we have engaged with several tribes across the country, or sorry, across the region. You can see the little orange triangles there. And our recent work has centered around developing climate and drought monitoring decision support tools. And so these are being used to help make water resource management decisions. Um, particularly out in the Wind River area of Wyoming. We're also working with some tribes in South Dakota and North Dakota, and then also Northeast Kansas. And so for them, we've been trying to develop training sessions to help them understand and interpret climate data, to get used to using drought monitoring tools uh, so that they can make those decisions um, on their reservations themselves. Didn't want to leave the National Weather Service out. We've also, in partnership with the uh, NOAA Central Region and Great Lakes collaboration teams, we have put on two workshops so far um, for climate focal points uh, in our region. And so we wanted to bring folks together so that we could all meet face-to-face, -face, get an introduction to regional climate services and what that means and who the players are, go out and see mesonets, learn about them, see what kind of data are available, get hands-on experience with specialized climate and drought tools, and then also explore opportunities to collaborate. And so we've got another one lined up for the Great Lakes region. You can see that there in the teal color. And that's going to be led by the Great Lakes team along with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. And so slowly we're kind of making our way across the, the National Weather Service Central region. Got Montana up there a little bit in the Western region there. But our hope is that we can build this community of people who understand regional climate services and can work together when different issues arise, like the drought that we're experiencing now in the Northern Plains. So what's next? Because i got to be wrapping this up. So we've got some ACES Climate Summary Map enhancements coming down. Um, so we've got a new programmer who's working on that. We're hoping to get some new areas put in there, some new variables. So that'll be really exciting. This haven't been updated in a long time. So we're looking forward to that. We're working on some SPEI data products. So that's the Drought Index, the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index. So that'll be another way to, to help monitor some drought there. Uh, the Municipal Specific Climate Tools website, like I mentioned earlier, that's going to be up and running later this year. And we do have several training events that are going to be going on this spring, or sorry, this summer and fall, especially with um, tribes from Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, and then also we've got some wildlife folks interested in getting trained up on how to use climate data, so working with the Crane Trust out in Kearney, Nebraska. Um, so we do have a quarterly newsletter. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. That's my direct information. So there's all sorts of ways to stay in touch. If you have any questions or you ever need anything from the High Plains, we're here to help. Centership over to Kyle. So we have Kyle Gray from the Southern Regional Climate Center. So Kyle was born and raised in South Dakota. He graduated with an undergraduate degree from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in 2004. His major was interdisciplinary studies with an atmospheric sciences focus. 
During that time, Kyle works for the Animal and Range Sciences Department at SDSU South Dakota State. Following the completion of his bachelor's, Kyle worked for the South Dakota State climatologist at the time, Dr. Dennis Toady, installing mesonet stations throughout western South Dakota. He returned to South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and completed his master's in 2007. His thesis focused on micrometeorology, trace gas fluxes, and carbon budgets. Following the completion of his master's, Kyle obtained employment at the Southern Regional Climate Center as the user services climatologist beginning in 2008. He remained in that position until April 2017, at which point he was promoted to his current position of regional climatologist at the SRCC. So Kyle, if you are ready, you can go ahead. Yes, I sure am, and uh, thank you everyone for listening in on this. I'm also uh, joined by our IT director, Dr. David Sathiaraj. And so uh, he is the programmer uh, behind most of the products that you're going to see, if not all the products you're going to see today. And uh, thank you, Natalie, for uh, summing up what the RCC network is all about. And so we are the Southern Regional Climate Center based in uh, LSU, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And our coverage area is Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi. And so uh, our mission and, and the services that we provide are very similar to the ones that were highlighted by Natalie before. And so uh, our approach to our presentation is, as we were putting this together uh, was to uh, focus on some particular tools that uh, have been in development here at the Southern Regional Climate Center, uh, tools that were put together with the idea of assisting uh, in decision making and uh, basically chronicling conditions that are occurring in, in various areas, not necessarily limited to the southern region, but uh, uh, certainly a, a regional emphasis uh, is part of that. And so uh, the first one that we're going to talk about here is the uh, Southern U.S. Drought Tool. And uh, so what we have here, basically the, the purpose behind this product was to, uh, I don't know if expands the right word, but, but, but uh, uh, be an enhancement to the uh, drought monitor. And so uh, what you can do is you can look at some of this data and, and compare uh, current events to past events. And uh, it, it's more of a, of a quantitative analysis as opposed to the drought monitor, uh, certainly in terms of the borders. And so uh, I'm just going to give a quick demonstration of how this product works. So it defaults to Louisiana. Uh, we're not in anything like a drought down here. So uh, we're going to go back to a state that actually has been mentioned previously which is Montana, and uh, it, it's, it defaults to the current date, but you can go back uh, to any date that you'd like to. Uh, the map layer refers to uh, this down here, and so uh, I'm going to go to kind of my favorite, which is the percentage of normal, and then the time period, you can go back 30 days, 60, 90, 180, or 365, so I will just go back to 90 days. And there's an FAQ button here that uh, summarizes what the product does, the purpose behind it, so on and so forth. And so we're looking at climate divisions here. And uh, what you can see is you have the total rainfall, and this is divisional data, the differential from normal, percentage from normal, and then the driest rank, and then the driest on record for all of these different divisions. And this goes back about to 1900 or so. And so you'll see, a lot of times you'll see similar years that pop up. And then the wettest on records, and then uh, the SPI. So most people probably know what that is uh, in this form, but for those that don't, uh, it does give a, uh, if you click on the column header, it will give you an explanation uh, as to what that is. Gotcha. Okay, and so uh, you can also sort these columns by clicking on these arrows here uh, in terms of DFN. Uh, most to least. And uh, if you look down here, then there's a summary of, of drought conditions. So you can kind of see how it has evolved over time uh, in certain divisions. And so uh, this is a pretty useful tool. And uh, once again, uh, it, it, it was originally uh, put together for states basically in our region across the south. And then uh, over time, as uh, I guess word of mouth, whatever you want to call it, uh, eventually, we had some interest from other uh, states as well, uh, like the National Weather Service in Montana for one. Uh, we got some calls from California. So eventually, this was expanded to include, I think, a total of 16 states. But we would like to uh, make this more of a national product uh, if, if, if there's interest and, and funding available. 
So uh, that's the first product that we wanted to talk about. And so the second one is our uh, climate information data portal. Uh, this is a new version of Climod, which is uh, uh, formed from ACES, which is kind of the backbone, the, the spine of our operations. And uh, originally, the, the first Climod that was put together, all the RCCs had one interface. And eventually, over time, we kind of realized that we needed to have more of, of a regional uh, usefulness to the product. And over time, uh, technologies advance, user feedback, uh, things change. And eventually, we had to do some product tweaks, add some new products. Uh, expand query options, things like that. So over the past couple of years, we've been in the development of this particular product. And so uh, I'm just going to uh, show a handful of products here just to give you an idea of some of the capabilities that it has. Certainly not all the capabilities, but uh, a good chunk of them. So there's some basic products here. Uh, the first one we're going to start off with is the annual summaries. And so uh, we'll go back to the last full year, 2016. You can use several different elements uh, for this presentation. I'm just going to stick with Precip. And uh, one of the things that I like about this compared to the old Climod is we have some other options in terms of searching for station. Uh, of course, station ID, station name, current location. Uh, if you select this option, the site will actually detect where you're hitting it from and then clue in on that area. Uh, the one that I like the most in particular is click on a map. Uh, especially in cases where maybe uh, station name uh, isn't in a city where they're at. And so sometimes there'll be uh, uh, errors there, some confusion, but if you just like to click on a map, then uh, you know right where to go. And so uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the uh, Baton Rouge area where we're based. So I'm just going to zoom in, and uh, once you click on that, uh, this shows all National Weather Service stations and uh, Cocoa Ross stations. So if you thumb over a particular marker, it will give you the station name, uh, the station ID, and the period of record for that particular parameter that you've chosen. And so uh, I'm going to clue in here on the Baton Rouge Airport. So once you click on that, uh, this is pretty basic information here. It's the daily precipitation totals for the entire year. And here at the bottom, it summarizes the uh, totals by month, gives you a DFN. Of course, our uh, big flood, August 2016, that I'm sure a lot of you probably heard about in passing, uh, shows up well there. You have the options to download CSV or HTML files. So this is, this is very basic information uh, that's available to users for a lot of different uh, applications. So the second one that I want to talk about uh, is the seasonal rankings. And so you select that. And uh, in this case, I'm going to go with the average mean temperature. And let's see, so I'm going to do period of record for the Baton Rouge station, uh, which is back to 1930. And you can select seasonal ranges. Here I'll go from January 1st through the end of March. And uh, another good thing about this product, too, is it'll show your recently viewed stations on the bottom here, so you don't have to go through and redo the entire search process, unless you're looking for a different station. But in this case, I will not be doing that. So when you click on the link, and what you'll find here is in terms of average temperature going back to 1930, uh, this past January, February, and March is actually the warmest we had in Baton Rouge by actually a fairly good margin, uh, about one and a half degrees. And so uh, again, these are sortable. So uh, here, uh, the coldest, 1978. So actually, it wasn't too long ago, 2010, where we had a fairly cold average temperature. And so uh, 2014. So this is kind of a way of, of putting uh, uh, data into perspective over time. And, and as it was the case throughout most of the country, the uh, late winter and the spring, compared to normal, was extremely warm. And so uh, this is a uh, uh, a representation of that. The uh, next thing I want to talk about is the threshold exceedance summary. And uh, this is, uh, so I'll go with the max temp here, uh, do greater than say 75. You can also do this for precip as well. Uh, again, period of record for the station. And once again, uh, I'll go from January to March. And again, click on Baton Rouge Airport. And so what this will show here is the number of times that the temperature was over 75 degrees uh, going back 
uh, in this case from January to February. So uh, obviously there was quite a few. And, uh, and in fact, I think uh, at least one out of every three days, uh, the temperature was above 75 degrees during January, February, March was extremely uh, abnormal. So, and that's something you can do for high precip events as well. Uh, just kind of a way of, of summarizing uh, how many times that that's occurred. Uh, we, we get a lot of requests for, uh, for data similar to this. So, um, so the next thing I'm going to look at are the monthly climate data summaries. And so for this particular product, uh, I'm just going to go with the year 2016. And basically, this is just a, a summary a uh, monthly summary in this case of conditions at the Baton Rouge Ryan Airport. So this will show th these are not the normals. This is the actual observed data. Uh, monthly summaries for each month of 2016 gives the max minimum, uh, the high date of occurrence, the low, and then the number of, of times that the temperature was above uh, 90 degrees, below 32, so on and so forth. So as you can see naturally during the summer months, very, very warm down here. Uh, just about every day gets above 90 degrees. About the only time that we don't is if there is a, a tropical system in the area or if afternoon convection starts early enough to where there just isn't enough insulation to, to get the temperature to that level. So again, so some nice summary statistics here. And so the next one that I want to talk about is a station summary. Oh. And so uh, this one is pretty cut and dried. Uh, oh, here it goes. So these are the actual, so as opposed to the other one, which is actually observed monthly summaries, these are the, 20, uh, the 1981 to 2010 climate normals. So this shows here the uh, average monthly max min, uh, the highest temperature ever recorded. So back to 1930 at the airport is 105. People generally think it uh, would be higher than that, but it's kind of hard to get that temperature up there with high humidity. And so uh, the lowest temperature, uh, 8 degrees back in 1989. And so it gives you uh, here a uh, 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 summary of average number of temperatures, days of temperatures above 90 degrees, so on and so forth. So that's just, uh, just kind of for general information. And so uh, another one I wanted to talk about is the activity planner. Now this is just kind of a fun one. Uh, we'll just go with uh, July 4th. Uh, let's just do period of record. So a lot of times people are kind of curious. Uh, th this actually comes up too with a Mardi Gras day as well. So what this will show is uh, starting from, let's see. Yeah, so starting from, uh, if you sort it that way, from the most recent July 4th all the way back is a high uh, maximum temperature and minimum precip and snowfall on that particular day, which of course in our case will be zero, but it's there anyway for your viewing pleasure. And so, uh, uh, you know, like getting a low of 69 uh, in, in July here is uh, very, very rare to say the least. And on the top, it gives you some uh, summary statistics as well. So equal to or 90, better than 90 degrees, 69 out of the 88 years. I actually figured it'd be even more than that. So that's just something kind of cool uh, to look at. And uh, the next to last product, uh, this is one that uh, Dr. Sathya Raj was instrumental in developing. Uh, cumulative precip history. This is more of a graphically based product. And so what this shows here is it gives you this line graph and it defaults to the current year, which is in blue. Uh, the wettest year, which is actually last year, uh, in no small part due to the August flood, which you can see there towards the right middle. Uh, the normal here is in green. And then the driest year uh, is highlighted there in the red. So it defaults to those settings. And then what you can do is you can uh, mouse over different years and it'll actually show there on the top. And so it's just kind of a fun sort of a, a graphical way of, of looking at this, uh, of looking at precip data. And so then we have a uh, user specific uh, products and uh, one that we wanted to mention was called AgStats. This is used by, uh, we have folks in Mississippi, uh, Louisiana and Arkansas. Uh, part of the USDA, uh, the NAS. Uh, so basically what this is, is uh, uh, what I send out is a weekly statistics. So uh, in this case, I go back to uh, July 9th 
and then we can load any number of these stations. I'm just kind of doing this as a, uh, so it loads that up and then what this shows, it's a multi-data, multi-station data summary and so then uh, I download this as a CSV file and then send it off and so uh, this is something that's used actually by quite a few people in the uh, agricultural community as well. So we have, uh, the, the point of this is we have a wide range of products on this and they were developed with users in mind across all different sectors across all different decision-making uh, uh, fields. So, uh, and this is something that's been in development for the last couple of years and it's an update on the old uh, system. Now something a little bit more uh, specific to our area that is in line with the, uh, yeah, and uh, so, you know, if, if we have any questions, if you have any questions about these products along the way, I'll just go ahead and submit those and, and we'll get to those at the end. And so uh, this product that's uh, uh, more in line with what uh, Natalie talked about earlier with the coastal resiliency is the storm surge product here. And so uh, what you can do is uh, once you get to that, you can click on any point uh, along the Gulf Coast here and also along the, the coverage goes along the eastern seaboard as well. And so uh, you, you pick uh, whatever distance you'd like, you know, 25, 20, 50 miles of that certain area. And then once you click on the map, uh, these observations will actually show up. And, and these are storm surge observations from storms going back to 1895. And so uh, I actually assisted in putting this database together a few years ago, and it was uh, uh, quite a undertaking, to put it mildly. But uh, the products and the, and the useful information we've gotten out of it has been more than worth it. And so uh, let's see. So in this case, let's click on. So we'll, we'll select uh, surges here in the uh, Houston area. And so when you scroll down, those the the, the values that are indicated by the markers up here uh, appear below. We have storm t tide uh, surge. Uh, these are also sortable. It defaults, I believe, to alphabetical, but you can sort these by. Uh, highest storm tide, uh, storm surge as well. And so uh, so it'll, it'll give you the raw values there to the right and also if you click on the uh, uh, marker itself, it'll actually list the storm and the surge. So uh, probably the meat and potatoes of this product is what it appears here on the right. Now these are return periods. So a uh, 10 year return period for any point in this area, not just here or here, but at any point in this area, a 10-year return period would be 5.46 foot storm surge and then onward and upward. So uh, every 100 years or a, ch a 1 in 100 chance in any individual year, you'll see a storm surge anywhere in this area of 17.49 feet. And uh, so in terms of decision making, uh, if you were wanting to build some kind of a structure uh, and you wanted it to last a certain number of years. Uh, you say you wanted it to be able to withstand an 80-year storm surge uh, event, then this is what this graphic is for. So in this case, 16.32 feet. And
office. But we display basically four things, uh, records in a month. So if you want to do a query on all records for, like, say, just the month of July, just the month of February, uh, records for a calendar day. So you can look up records for any individual day. Recent daily records, so those are records that have been set recently, so there will be some days where uh, there aren't any records set, some where there are a lot, it just kind of depends, so not, there aren't always uh, values that show up for that. And then all-time records. So let's uh, start off with the all-time records. Uh, we'll go with the uh, high max temperature, and so you click go here. And so what this is showing is the all-time high Maximum temperature, these are primarily ASOS stations. I don't know if we have AWOS ones mixed in there as well. Uh, no co-op stations at this time. That is a feature that we might be able to add later. And so uh, if you mouse over the individual record, uh, you can see here that the record 105 set August 30th, 2000. And so uh, one of the things, the, the, the periods of record are not the same for all stations. So you do have to be a little bit sensitive to those uh, when you look at these. So uh, in this case, you know, uh, 1930, 1948, and so, uh, and incidentally, this can also kind of act as a QC tool as well when you see values like this, uh, something that maybe looks a little bit suspicious, and uh, the period of record on that is uh, pretty low. We actually investigated that particular product and, uh, or that particular uh, data point value and actually turned out to be erroneous, so that's in the process of being corrected. So, uh, and then you can zoom around and, and uh, take a look at some of these and, and uh, like areas like Phoenix and uh, uh, Los yeah. Nationwide tour. Yeah, it, it, this is a nationwide tour to a tool. So it's available for uh, so that's all time records and you can do that for uh, uh, let's see, do like low minimum temperature. So for me you know, I might be a little curious what's going on here in the uh, northern plains. And uh, so especially people here in our region get a kick of looking at some of these values and and uh, it's like, I don't know how it could be that cold. And actually, the coldest temperature I remember experiencing when I lived up there was about minus 30. And uh, that was pretty bad. So, so those are all-time records. Uh, you can do the same thing for records in a month. And uh, so select the month. Uh, we'll just go with July here. And uh, high max temperature. Again, since we're focused on South Dakota, we'll just stay there for now. And uh, so again, same concept. You mouse over. Uh, down here, you can also filter out uh, records as well. And so uh, recent daily records, uh, let's see. I know it's been uh, awfully warm in the desert southwest lately, so we might be able to get something there. But uh, yeah, so if, if a record has been recently set, then it'll appear on, oh. yeah, let me zoom out here. So it'll appear, and again, you uh, uh, it'll show you the period of record for that particular station. So in that case, about a 20-year record. And then, uh, so that pretty much covers that product. So it's just kind of a neat way of, of displaying records. Again, it's available for the uh, entire U.S. And I know the, uh, Med the Midwest uh, uh, Regional Climate Center actually put a link on their site to this tool, and so it's gotten a little bit of extra uh, uh, usage that way. We also have the uh, reservoir tool, and so this has been developed uh, by uh, Dr. Sathya Raj, and this is, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say the start, but uh, this is sort of the, the beginning of the idea of synthesizing climate data with other data sets as well. And this is also uh, a part of the uh, SKIP uh, program, the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program, of which we are a part of and we support uh, here at the Southern Regional Climate Center. And uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, it's only operational really for Texas. Uh, this is a product that we're looking to expand nationally, but uh, right now we're lacking the resources to do so. So if there's interest from uh, users and stakeholders in other states uh, for to develop this product, we have the manpower, we have the, the computing capabilities. Uh, we just you know need to, to uh, have the funding and, and available. So basically, so it shows up here, uh, we're looking at Texas, and you can see here the map legend gives you an idea of, of the how full some of these reservoirs are. And uh, sort of like with other products, you can zoom in uh, on a particular area. So uh, I guess for this presentation, I'll select this lake. 
And uh, we have a little bug here if the uh, cross-section plot, so that's not currently working at this time. And so what this shows here are reservoir levels, uh, and it gives you, it kind of defaults to a smaller uh, uh, time span, but you can expand this uh, all the way back to as long as you want to. And so you can see over time how the reservoir levels have changed. And uh, another good thing about this is, is you can also try to get these in sync just a little bit here. Uh, so you can actually see uh, these, these are uh, monthly precipitation totals. Oh, daily, excuse me. And uh, so you can actually see uh, uh, responses uh, in the levels of the reservoir. I'm looking at the same thing here as uh, we have periods that have wet and uh, dry periods as well. So it, it's a way of, of, of looking at, at climate data and how uh, reservoir levels respond. Uh, this is something that can also be done for river levels, uh, which is something that Dr. Sathi Raj will mention briefly. So we have the uh, elevation capacity plot here. And uh, so, like I said, there's kind of the plain Jane approach to displaying uh, raw climate data for what it is, some summary statistics, and then there's tools like the reservoir tool that actually synthesize uh, climate data with other data sets, and that's kind of, as we look to the future, those are the things that we're looking to do. And so Dr. Sathya Raj has a couple of data products that are in development that he would like to talk about, and so I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Sathya Raj. Emily, I uh, want to be sensitive to time. I, I don't know if uh, how we are doing on time. Uh, yeah, we, we um, technically go till around 3, um, so maybe around 5 more minutes, and we've only gotten a couple of questions, so we might run a couple minutes over. But. Okay, we're good. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so my, um, my background is, uh, is in IT and software development, and I have a small team here. Um, uh, I head the IT group, and we have a systems manager and a... Uh, uh, a couple of programmers, uh, some are graduate assistant programmers, uh, some, and we have one full-time programmer. And uh, one of one of our goals has been uh, taking these, looking at climate data as big data sets, and then looking at products or industries uh, or domains that uh, correlate with uh, climate. And so one of the things we, uh, this is a project that I worked with with one of my master's students. Uh, is looking at uh, weather hazards, like taking climate data records, and then looking at uh, big transportation data sets. And so uh, we partnered with uh, an industry partner uh, that had access to Georgia uh, Department of Transportation data. Uh, and then what we looked at was about 42 traffic counters uh, over a five-year period uh, looking at what kind of weather impacts uh, affected uh, the city of Georgia and some of the traffic counters. And so uh, this particular tool is a decision support tool that came out of that uh, research work. And what you see over here is as soon as you click on that traffic counter, it breaks down traffic volume um, by day. And then if you click on a certain day, uh, it'll actually break it down by hours. Uh, and so this combines like predictive analytics, uh, data visualization, and then combines climate data with other avenues such as transportation. And so what this is just, this particular graphic is just looking at uh, traffic volume by day and by hour on the right. Uh, green means pretty much effective, very uh, smooth flowing tra uh, traffic. Um, the orange levels are probably the ones that um, uh, had bad traffic. But further down below is what, this is the more interesting part, is we started looking at across, uh, you know, looking at about seven to eight million data points, looking at it at an hourly time scale um, and breaking it down into an extreme case and a base case. So an extreme case would be, I think, like a rainfall, an hourly rainfall of like 0.5 millimeters or more. And then the base case is where there's no rain. And then looking at traffic volume, uh, comparing traffic volume by hour um, and seeing where uh, the lags are. So what you see, the blue case is, the blue line is the base case, and the green line is the extreme case where there was extreme rainfall. And uh, and you can see the short, uh, you know, the, the, the decrease in traffic volume uh, between, you know, like peak hours or like late afternoon hours from like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon all the way to eight in the, eight in the evening. And so you could do, we did this for 
other uh, weather variables such as visibility, um, temperature during only winter times, uh, and then wind speeds. And so you can see uh, some of the effects on that particular traffic station. And we did this for 42 other traffic counters. And so this is a this is a really good uh, study, and uh, it's going to be published uh, soon in a journal, uh, a geography journal, uh, on how we can interact uh, tra transportation data with weather data. Um, this is another project that I've been involved in, uh, which combines looking at rainfall stations uh, and trying to find correlated uh, river gauges, or that are river gauges that are sensitive to precipitation inputs from uh, rainfall. And so if you look at, so what we did was we, we basically did this for the entire country. We mapped uh, rainfall and river gauge pairs. Uh, so what you saw over there with the gray dot is Baton Rouge Airport. And all of this is on a 20 mile radius, all the river gauges that are sensitive to any input that comes in um, at, at Baton Rouge. I mean, any rainfall that occurs at Baton Rouge Airport. And so what you see is like the darker green uh, ones are highly correlated, um, as well, whereas the, uh, the orange ones are not. Um, and this is because there is a levee that runs across. And so uh, any uh, rainfall here doesn't actually flow into the Mississippi River because of the levee. And so, uh, uh, so we this, and then once we found these correlations, then we applied machine learning techniques to predict what is the peak water level rise uh, within uh, for each of those correlated stations. And so, um, I don't want to spend too much time on it because of the time that we have, uh, limited time that we have. But what we what we got was R square values with very high accuracy uh, for the predictions. Once we found out the most correlated uh, rainfall stations. And so, uh, so this is one example of, uh, you know, uh, the most correlated rainfall station to Baton Rouge, and you can see some of the results in here. So I wanna I wanna stop and uh, answer any questions that people may have. Okay, thanks, guys. So as a reminder, um, we will take questions at this time. So please enter any questions you have in the questions pane of the go to webinar control panel. Um, we did have one question come in a little bit earlier um, for um, all presenters. It's a bit more specific, but I'll just kind of keep it more generic. Um, do you guys provide projections um, for climate, any climate change projections, or do you guys have any products dealing with climate change? And Natalie, you can answer as well if you guys have any. Yeah, we, we uh, do have a couple of products uh, in, uh, in the climate data portal that Kyle had showed. Uh, there are a couple of products that uh, provide climate projection data as well. Okay. And no, we, we don't provide projections here at our center. Okay, great. Um, and then are all the um, SRCC products shown on the um, Southern Climate Impact Planning Program RESA data tools page, I don't see many of the products referenced here. Well, uh, the reservoir tool, you should find the reservoir of the drought tool on it. And uh, in fact, all the, all the products on uh, the Southern Climate Impacts Planning uh, data tools page, all of those are, were built here and housed here. Um, so they are all running in our data center. OK, great. Um, so I don't see any more questions at this time. I'll give it another um, few seconds. So anyone with um, last minute questions, please answer them now. Otherwise, um, I really appreciate everyone um, for participating and thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, this webinar was recorded, so it will be online in a few days and I will send the link um, when that's finished. So um, see no other questions. Thank you guys for your participation and um, to all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.